Um, so I will start right away with an overview. Um, we had powerful cache attacks like flash and reload, like crime and probe on x86 in a, lot, in a few last years. And we have no, not seen any powerful cache attacks like this on ARM CPUs and on mobile devices. And we asked the question, why is that? Why are there no such powerful attacks there? And we started identifying the challenges and solving them systematically. Um, we find that we can make all cache attacks work on ARM CPUs as well. Uh, it depends on the ARM CPU which specific attacks work better or maybe don't work. Um, we can use those attacks on Android phones to monitor user activity like swipes. Uh, we can determine the length of the swipe. Uh, we can distinguish key presses from swipes. So we can do all sorts of uh, user activity monitoring. Uh, we also found that on Android you still have weak crypto because no one knows that, uh, that uh, ARM CPUs are very vulnerable to those uh, cache side channel attacks as well. So no one thinks about um, implementing crypto in a safe way. So they still use T-tables on Android in some cases. Um, and then we also thought, okay, we might check out uh, whether we can attack the ARM trust zone. And there we found that depending on what happens inside the trust zone, we can see a difference in the, uh, in the cache by doing a prime and probe attack. So what is a cache attack? Basically, we look at the timing, the access time of uh, memory access. And there we can distinguish cache hits and cache misses. And cache hits are those memory accesses that are already buffered in the cache. Cache misses are those that have to be served from the DRAM, so they take more time. And here you can see that they are very well uh, distinguishable. Yeah, this is a log scale, so it's really very well distinguishable. What can you do with that? Imagine that you have a shared library, and you would acquire, um, you would write a program that, that um, opens this shared library and maps it into memory. Um, then, if another program uses the same shared library, for instance, to process keystrokes, something like this could happen. So you can see the key down and the key up events here, and uh, basically you can, uh, you can make something up from that by, um, by using those inter-keystroke timings to derive whatever the user entered. There are also more powerful attacks uh, like this, so in some cases you can even uh, single out uh, some of the keys, so you can, you can determine that the users press, press the specific key depending on the library that you're using. So these attacks are really powerful. The most important techniques that we use today are flush and reload and prime and probe. Both of them work on the last level cache and both work across cores for this reason. Flush and reload works like this. So you have an attacker address space and a victim address space and a cache in the middle. And if you access a memory location, it will be cached in, in your cache. And it will be cached for both at the same time because the CPU cache is shared. Um, it will be shared in the cache as well, the shared memory. So now the attacker can just remove it from the cache, this, uh, this particular cache line. And then the, if the victim reloads the data, uh, the attacker can also reload the data and notices that now it is not a cache miss, but a cache hit, so the victim must have reloaded this particular cache line, this specific memory location. And this has a granularity of 64 bytes, and you can do this in a really high resolution, so you can monitor what the victim process does on a 64-byte granularity uh, at a high, high frequency. The prime and probe attack works a bit different, so the prime and probe attack does not require shared memory. Instead, here you fill an entire cache set, and then you have the victim do some computation and replacing uh, memory uh, cache lines in this particular cache set. And if the attacker now tries to reaccess it, its own memory locations, uh, you will first see fast access and then maybe a slow access and then, then the attacker knows that the victim has done some specific operation on addresses congruent to this cache set. How are caches today organized? If you look at an Intel CPU, you will have three levels of caches, maybe four, but uh, the fourth level is a bit different, so I will only talk about the three levels here. Um, level one and level two are private, so if you have any data in there, that's not shared. If you have shared memory, 
uh, you might have multiple copies of them in the level one caches and the level two caches. But the last level cache, the level three cache, is shared and it is inclusive. Any data that is anywhere in level one or level two cache must also be in the level three cache. And then you have the nice property that if you throw something out of the level three cache, it will also be evicted from the local L1 and L2 caches of the victim process. So if you run simultaneously, you can really force data that the other process uses out of the cache just by accessing the memory that you are supposed to be able to ac access because of this property. On ARM, this is a bit different. Uh, there you have two layers of cache, usually the level one cache, which is again private, and the level two cache, with, which is again shared. But this time uh, on ARM CPU, you have a, a, wide, uh, a wide range of possible implementations. And usually the level two cache will not be inclusive, and therefore you cannot, if, you cannot throw something out of some uh, other level one cache because it won't go out of the level one cache just because you do something in the level two cache, right? So. The first challenge we identified is this, that we have non-inclusive caches and we need to perform attacks on those non-inclusive caches and that might be a bit tricky. Um, th then the next part, uh, we, we found another problem. On modern, C mon modern smartphones, you will have multiple CPUs. For instance, with a big little ar architecture, you will have, for instance, an, a weaker uh, A53 and a stronger CPU, the A57. And depending on what you do, you will be scheduled to one of those CPUs, and one of them might even be turned off. And you can't really force the CPU to locate you on one of the two um, processors, right? Uh, an app shouldn't be able to do that, and uh, we assume that the app is not able to do that. So we want to do an attack without any shared cache across the CPUs. And we will later on find out how we solve that challenge too. Um, another challenge we have, for instance, to perform a flush and reload attack, you have to flush something from memory. On x86, that's easy because you have an unprivileged flush instruction that any process can use at any time. Uh, on ARMv7, we have privileged flush instructions, but for the user space, that's not possible. The user space can't flush memory. Uh, on ARMv8, you can unlock a flush instruction for user space, and this is done by uh, off-the-shelf devices. For instance, we had that case uh, with a Samsung Galaxy S6, there the user space again can use a flush instruction, which is great for the flush and reload attack. So challenge again, um, here the challenge just focuses on ARMv7a, where we have no flush instruction. We need to figure out how to do that then. And the solution how to do uh, cache eviction without um, a flush instruction is accessing a lot of memory and throwing data out of the cache by that, doing that. Previous work always worked with strategies like ex you have a an, 16-way an cache and you access 16 memory locations that go into that cache set and then it's evicted. Um, but if you look at current ARM CPUs, so they have a pseudo-random replacement policy, so you might have to access more than uh, 16 uh, addresses to evict a 16-way cache. And it's, it's also it not really guaranteed that you have some specific uh, eviction rate. So this will introduce noise in your attack. You will have false positives, false negatives, and it will make the attack uh, just take longer or make it impossible if you want to want to spy on singular events like keystrokes. Um, so the challenge here is perform fast and reliable cache eviction, but that was later on, we will see that that was rather easy. Um, a more difficult part, um, but we also found very nice solutions for that, timing measurements. In, we we um, checked all the previous work on Android uh, cache attacks, and uh, we found that most of them use uh, unprivileged, uh, use the privileged um, cycle counter. So you can only access them from kernel mode, um, or you have to write a kernel module to unlock it for the user space. So you can do that on a rooted Android phone. So you assume that the Android phone is rooted, but uh, if the Android phone is not rooted, then you cannot perform these attacks. Um, on x86, again, this is easy because the RETC instruction is unprivileged, so you don't need to have a, a um, prog program running with root privileges there in any case. So uh, challenge five is we need to find unprivileged, highly accurate timing sources, and we investigated a few new timing sources here. 
So the challenge is just an overview. We will now step through the challenges and how we solved them. So for the non-inclusive caches, attacking uh, in, in instruction inclusive data non-inclusive cache, so that means um, in level one instruction, all data in level one instruction caches must also be in the level two unified cache. And uh, data non-inclusive, that means that data can be in both levels, it can be in one of them, there is no strict policy on that. How can we do an attack here? So we can just access enough data that it spills our level one data cache, and then it will fill the entire level two uh, unified cache set um, over time. And by this, we can evict the instruction. So we have a data non-inclusive cache, and we can still throw something out from the other um, program. How does it work with entirely non-inclusive caches? That gets more tricky and also more noisy, of course. Um, the first part, again, is easy. So if we want to look at cache hits, then we, we find that the cache coherency protocol allows us to, to measure the access time of a remote cache hit. So the, uh, the cache coherency protocol won't actually fetch the data from DRAM because that was, would, it, would be a waste of time. Instead, it fetches the data from the remote level one cache. And this is much faster. We actually only find a very small timing difference between the local and the remote level one cache. But what about eviction? And eviction gets a bit more tricky. So again, we will spill our level one set and we'll fill the entire level two cache set. And if we now look at an ARM CPU on, in the, on the level one cache, they usually have something like uh, two ways or four ways. That's not much. So two ways, you can access two memory locations that are congruent to each other. And that means they, they have like 128 or 256 cache sets. So many addresses will map to the same cache set, and having a, an associativity in the cache of two means that you will evict, uh, will evict um, data and instructions by yourself if there is no room in the level two cache. So our trick is we keep the level two cache filled all the time, and then we throw out data by that indirectly from the remote level one cache. And if we look at the timing for that, so here we can see the timing for a cache hit or a cache miss. So if the eviction was uh, done on another core, um, that's really a small difference and it works in both cases. More complicated, or actually not more complicated, but we thought it might be more complicated to do the attack on multiple CPUs. But again, the cache coherency protocol saves the day for the attacker and uh, it allows us to do the remote ca um, cache hits over the coherency protocol again. And again, we can uh, apply our technique to keep the level two cache filled to increase the probability of a remote L1, L2 eviction. We also observed that you can do remote uh, CPU flushes, so that's nice for the flush and reload attack, uh, but this is also, so it sort of works, it adds a lot of noise, and you, tend, you need much more repetitions to perform an attack, but you can still perform a cross-CPU cross prime and probe attack here. So for the flush instruction, last year at Usenix, uh, I presented the cache template attacks paper, and in that paper, we had a short paragraph on the evict and reload attack, where the idea was to remove the flush instruction, and um, that was by then uh, discussed whether that would be a reasonable countermeasure against flush and reload attack. And basically, we showed that we can do eviction instead. And uh, yeah, that's the evict and reload attack then. It works exactly the same as flush and reload, just you do cache eviction. It works on x86 very reliably, but we now get the problem that we have to sol solve the unreliable cache eviction on our ARM CPUs. Um, and there we worked uh, just recently on uh, Rowhammer JS, where this was our uh, central idea to replace the flush instruction by very efficient and fast uh, and, and um, working uh, memory, a loop of memory accesses that evicts the data from the cache. And so we again uh, spent many, many days um, doing sort of row hammer on, on, on phones to find eviction strategies. So you do this in a, in a loop a few, multiple, a few million times, and then you can have an average uh, amount of cycles uh, that the eviction takes. So here we had a strategy, so the 48-48 the strategy, that would be what you had to use before, and it didn't work on, on our phone, the Alcatel in this case. 
Um, so it had a very bad eviction rate, and we had to go up to 800 ad addresses to stick to this old eviction strategy um, to get to an eviction rate above 99%. And then we said, okay, we, we need to figure out uh, what's, what's working be better, and we found a strategy with uh, 23 unique addresses and 50 accesses to, to those unique addresses, and that's much faster than the 48 uh, accesses, and also the eviction rate is much higher. The reason for that is that you keep the data in the cache more likely, and therefore the accesses are faster. Then for the last challenge, uh, the unprivileged timing. So we compared the performance counter with the perf event open interface. That provides a syscall that allows you to read the uh, cycle count register from user space. So user space application can just use this syscall and uh, read the cycle count through this syscall. Another method was clock get time, which is a C library interface, which gives you a nanosecond or a close to nanosecond accurate timestamp. And then we also checked out the um, idea of um, using a thread counter. So you have a second thread running, and it increments a global variable all the time. And we thought, OK, uh, in worst case, if you have no timing information at all, you can still go back to that, and then you can use the thread, the global, uh, global variable to count that. But it probably won't be very accurate. Now, if we look at the actual measurement data we got, um, so you see in black the performance counter register, uh, the peak for the hit and the cache miss, the um, timing difference. And in red, you see the solution with uh, syscall. And surprising uh, part here is that the syscall uh, actually is a bit faster for the, uh, for the cache hit. And probably that's because our implementation for the performance counter register was just less efficient. Um, the other part, so in case of a cache miss, it was much slower. Probably they optimized the other code path more. I don't know. Um, but this is all on a very small scale. Um, more interesting, so the clock get time also works, but it's less accurate. You see that the, the bluish uh, line, they are closer together. And the most interesting part here is that the counter thread has a very uh, large distance here. And also, if you look at the, at the scaling factor, so we had to scale down the counter thread a lot. And uh, that showed us that with the counter thread, as long as we don't have any interrupt, the counter thread will be the most accurate way to measure the time. But if we have an interrupt, it ruins the measurement for that time. We then investigated what kinds of attacks we can perform. So we performed the flush and reload attack on the Samsung Galaxy S6, but we also performed the flush and flush attack. So there is a timing difference in the flush instruction alone, so you don't have to reload the data, actually. Uh, we performed the prime and probe attack on multiple devices. Here you can see a trace on the Alcatel One Touch Pop 2. Um, so it's a bit noisy, but it still works um, to transmit data or to spy on someone. We then compared the performance of our covered channels with uh, state-of-the-art covered channels. And there we found that we are uh, three orders of magnitude, almost three orders of magnitude faster uh, than state-of-the-art. And we can perform uh, attacks cross-core and cross-CPU. So our environment for the attack is not more restricting than previous work. Um, but it works in the same setup. We then implemented cache template attacks on the base of our uh, attack primitives that we got so far. And there we scanned all kinds of uh, libraries that are present on um, Android phones. And in this case, it's the lib input shared library. And we can distinguish uh, based on where a cache hit occurs, we can distinguish different events. So we know, for instance, on, based on address 8100, that uh, probably text has been uh, entered and not a swipe or a tap. So we did the same also on the an Android AOSP key keyboard. So in case the other library doesn't give any results on a phone, we can also do an attack here and again distinguish key groups. We didn't find any uh, library that actually leaked the specific key for us um, as on Linux, but um, on Android we only can distinguish the key groups. And if we do that over time, so here I have a trace of taps and swipes, and you can see the exact timestamp 
when the user touched the touch screen and removed the finger from the touch screen again. So you know exactly how long the swipe movement was. You can uh, distinguish taps and swipes because the taps are only very uh, small and, and, and short peaks. Um, the same works on here on a Gal Samsung Galaxy S6 with a flush and reload attack, and here it's with an evict and reload attack on the OnePlus One because it doesn't have a flush instruction there. And here I have a trace of a uh, cache template attack that distinguishes space and uh, keys. And this exactly gives you the length of the words that you entered in a, um, in a sentence, right? So this is also nice to, to spy on user input. We then uh, also tried to attack cryptographic algorithms. And we attacked Bouncy Castle, uh, which is a widely used crypto library. It's not so widely used anymore as it was some years ago, but it is still used uh, by WhatsApp, for instance. And the default uh, variant in Bouncy Castle uh, is a fast implementation of AES in software, and they use T-tables. So unless you uh, opt for the slow but safe variant, you will be using the T-table implementation, which is known to be vulnerable for timing attacks, um, and especially for cache timing attacks. So if we run an attack on this T-table implementation, it will look like this and leak us the key bytes immediately. You see a evict and reload attack on the left and a flush and reload attack on the right on the Samsung. Uh, these attacks are kind of artificial because we usually cannot acquire shared memory with uh, Bouncy Castle because Bouncy Castle is implemented in Java and the Java VM will create a copy of the T-table um, of the T-tables when uh, the program starts. So we then did a prime and probe attack on the Java, uh, on, the, on the crypto library in Java. And there we found that we, again, can get the key bytes out of that. Uh, we just need more repetitions because it, prime and probe is uh, more noisy. Then we used prime and probe uh, later on to check whether we can get some information out of the trust zone. And uh, that was a bit complicated because the trust zone, uh, we, we don't have the source code of, the trust zone, of, of programs running in the trust zone. So we didn't really know what was going on in there. Uh, we tried to find uh, timing differences for different RSA signature keys. And uh, we found timing differences, but um, we couldn't really, um, we couldn't really um, confirm or, or we, we couldn't really verify that we can distinguish keys. So it was below a threshold that we would still consider as noise, and therefore we uh, didn't include that in the paper. Uh, but what we have is we can uh, distinguish uh, invalid keys from valid keys. So you can see that there is a different computation going on in the trust zone. And if you would have uh, access to the source code, or if you would have more knowledge of, about what's happening in the trust zone, or you would run a template attack, like on, a, on an AES uh, T-table implementation, that's really easy. Um, then you could do a more sophisticated attack on trust zone as well. So trust zone doesn't protect against cache side channels, and uh, we just uh, show that, that it, indeed it doesn't. For the conclusions, uh, we show that all the powerful cache attacks are now applicable to smartphones, including uh, prime and probe and flash and reload. Uh, we are able to monitor user uh, activity with, with uh, high accuracy. We are able to derive crypto keys because Android was, uh, uh, apparently still uses weak crypto, and it shouldn't. And finally, we found leakage from the trust zone, and uh, we can use that later on in more sophisticated attacks. Thank you for your attention. I would be pleased to answer your questions later. So we have time for a few questions. If um, you have one, please approach the mic and state your name and affiliation. OK, so I, I will. Uh, Kick it off. Um, so I actually have a fairly specific question for the first one. So um, back on slide 32, you were um, distinguishing um, keystrokes that were entered by the user, right? Um, yeah. So I just wanted to clarify, you, you were not just distinguishing Which between one? space. Um, no, back on slide 32. 32, OK. Yeah. Um, let me just go there. 
So yeah, just I, just to clarify, um, because it wasn't clear to me, you're you're distinguishing also um, not not just between spaces and other keys, but really labeling. No, 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 there. no. This okay. is just the sentence that we typed on the on the touch screen. That is the ground truth. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. So it depends on what library you use. On Linux, for instance, the, the GTK library does a binary search over an array that translate, translates uh, key codes to um, UTF-8. And uh, the binary search uh, leaves a very nice access pattern in the cache, and then you can exactly derive uh, what key has been entered, with exactly with some, some limitations, of course. Um, but on Android, we didn't find such a library that performs a binary search over user input, or any search over user input. Interesting. Thanks. Hello, Daimon Wang from UC Riverside. I'm wondering, uh, I have some question about your timestamp counter method. So you said you can accurately measure, distinguish between hit and miss using a system call perform, perf event open and yeah. the clock at time. Mm -hmm. So are those system calls like uh, platform specific because we tried it in our attack and we found the perf event open has a very high overhead overhead and does not distinguish well. Okay, so for, for us, perf event open did work well on, uh, on those devices where it was available. It was not available on all devices. That's why we investigated more different methods. Um, clock at time worked for us on uh, all devices, but had a, due to the lower granularity, we had much more noise with clock at time. And the thread counter also worked for us on, on all devices. And for your thread counter, like uh, you said, the thread counter will not work if there's an interrupt. So do you have any measurement on how, uh, in your experiment, how much interrupt did you observe? Or it, it usually there's no interrupt whatsoever. Uh, yeah, so interrupts do not occur in, in that high frequency, so you can perform measurements. But for instance, for a keystroke attack, it would probably make it infeasible because um, um, you, you would not be able to distinguish a false positive from, from, uh, from anything else. You would have lots of uh, false positives because there will be multiple interrupts per second, um, but uh, you wouldn't know that this was not a keystroke. Thanks. Okay, um, I have uh, one more question. Um, so I, I know in this work that you, you, were, you were mainly focusing on attacks, right? But um, you know, have you talked to vendors about what might be done to detect or prevent these attacks? And, and uh, did your attacks give you any insight into what might be done? Well, uh, you can make attacks harder. Uh, you can not use shared memory, first of all. Then you can do a flush and reload attack, and you have to go th back to the uh, much more noisy prime and probe attack, and that probably won't work well on user input. Um, so uh, you could also uh, reduce the um, attack surface by, by um, removing functions like the flush instruction, of course. Um, but again, you can then do eviction instead. So it will make an attack harder and noisier, but it is not an ultimate solution. I think uh, uh, there is no uh, no really, really satisfying uh, solution on cache attacks yet. That is why there's still much research on, on countermeasures going on. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.